We're back. We had Michael Bratton on with us, I want to say five, six weeks ago. Very entertaining. The host of That SEC Podcast. And this is certainly a good time to bring him back up. Michael, how are you doing? Hey, doing good. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for coming on with us. So now we've had a little time to kind of analyze really what was week one uh, in the college football season. In the SEC, what was your biggest surprise? Uh, just how disappointing the league was uh, in all the marquee games, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday night. Lost every meaningful non-conference matchup. So I, I think the SEC's got a lot to prove week two with uh, a lot of big non-conference matchups coming up. Let, let's start for a second with some of the disappointments. Florida looked awful in the game against Utah, and it sort of begs the question long-term, is Billy Napier the right fit at Florida? What do you think? Hmm. Well, I guess it just depends on what you mean because I don't really believe in fits. I believe in winning, and he's not winning. I don't think Nick Saban was a fit for LSU. Uh, I certainly don't think guys like uh, – Let's see. I, I mean, Brian Kelly, of course, he embarrassed himself the other night also, but not a fit at LSU, but you win. We, we don't care about fits in the SEC. We care about can you win the games. Florida's not been doing it. He lost every meaningful rivalry game last season. And, uh, I mean, they looked pretty pathetic, but there's a reason why I had Florida number six in my SEC East ballot. I, I didn't think they'd be very good at all. Getting outclassed by a, a walk-on quarterback in a, in a Utah team featuring – several key players out though I mean it was disturbing they didn't look prepared they didn't look ready for the environment they were they talked a great game all camp reports were that you know this was a team that was going to be ready and they were anything but ready so yeah I mean Billy Napier's got he's got a heck of a lot to prove let's go to the uh the LSU Sunday night deal for a second um they're right in it midway through the third quarter and then just fall apart. Kind of give me your thoughts. What what do you make of that? Well, it kind of looked like they quit, and which was pretty disturbing for uh, such a big game that was hyped up as everybody had it as the game of the week. And, yeah, I mean, it was troubling. Uh, as someone that picked LSU to win the West, I'm certainly not very confident in that now. I, I realize it wasn't a conference game, so it, it doesn't factor in, but – Jane Daniels looked off. He looked like not on the same page with his receivers, which was troubling. I thought the offensive line was supposed to be a strength of LSU. It looked like a weakness. You know, a couple they had a couple goal-to-goal situations that come away with zero points. And we could sit here and what if the entire game. But had they cashed those opportunities in, I think they could have won that game. But as soon as they didn't, and this was early in the game, I knew they were not going to win. Because you can't go into a matchup like that go into the red zone, go-to-go situations and come away with zero points multiple times, you're just you're just not going to win. The, the margin for, for error is slim in a game like that. So it's deeply disturbing, but still I'm not ready to write off LSU just yet. Um, we've got a matchup this week of, and there they are, two guys that know each other very well, uh, Alabama and Texas in Tuscaloosa, if you think to the the times that Alabama has lost at home in recent years, a Johnny Manziel, a Joe Burrow, does Texas have what it takes to truly go in there and win? Uh, not based on what they showed week one. Now, they were playing a lesser opponent, Rice, but I'd heard so much all this hype about these these quarterbacks and the receivers and the tight end and the offensive line. And they did not impress me at all, again, against Rice. Now, the defense sure as heck looked good. I, th- I think that's the real matchup of this game, Alabama's offense versus uh, Texas defense. I think I think that is, is the key matchup. But I, I really want to see this Texas offensive line. How do they hold up? Can they run the ball on Alabama? Alabama's front seven I don't think is quite as formidable as most people are anticipating or, or expecting that a Nick Saban defense is. So, there's room to take advantage, but again, they couldn't get much push against Rice. So I don't expect Texas to to come into uh, Tuscaloosa and push Alabama around. So I don't know. I, I've, I've talked to several different people, and 
it's about 50-50 split of, of who's going to win this game, Texas or Alabama. So I'm hoping for a good game, but just going based off week one, I, I don't know how great of a game it'll really be. What did you think of Milrow? I mean, he was wildly impressive. And he's specifically pushing the ball down the field. Now, how good is Middle Tennessee? That's a fair question. But uh, he didn't look like a liability, and he certainly didn't look like uh, – I don't know why the competition went so long based on the way he played. And then the other guys come in and I mean, it was a world of difference. He, he's an incredible athlete scoring on the, uh, uh, the bad snap. I mean, that, that for most quarterbacks, that's a bus, busted play. You lose 12 yards. He turns it into a, I believe a 21 yard rushing touchdown. That was wildly impressive. But again, I'm, I'm not trying to put too much stock into what they did against MTSU. They were supposed to beat, MTSU I'm just I'm a little more disturbed to be honest with you all these Alabama fans in my mentions clamoring that they beat the pay, the breaks off MTSU I mean I back in the day I mean that that was to be expected but now it seemed like it was somewhat of a surprise to them so I made a point Saturday night to watch Tulane a little bit it's an intriguing program that used to be down at Vandy's level years ago this guy, Willie Fitz, has done a terrific job with them, and now they've got this big showdown with Ole Miss. Are they good enough at home to pull that off? Yes, yeah, it's interesting. I'm pulling up some stats I just did. I, I didn't realize they have the number two passing efficiency offense in the country right now. So, But on the flip side, Ole Miss is uh, number two in the country in scoring. So, I mean, this, this truly looks like uh, – Strength on weakness matchup. I, I think this is going to be a very high-scoring matchup with, with Pete Golding being in his first season as defensive coordinator down there at, at Ole Miss. This is going to be by far his toughest test to date uh, as a member of the Ole Miss program. So I, I don't anticipate Tulane's going to be able to, to get many stops in this ball game. I think Ole Miss will come up with, a, with enough to get the win. But I don't know. This is... This has got to be a, a Tulane Super Bowl type situation. So I'll, I'll be very curious to see how difficult they make it for Ole Miss going on the road to Tulane. I'm with you. It might take 40 for whoever wins it to win it. Uh, it's hard to imagine 13 to 7. Uh, this We're going to have some points put up in this one. That's at it, Tulane, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't know why an SEC team's playing at Tulane, but they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th there's probably some backstory we don't know all of uh, all of the stuff about, but I thought the same thing you did. Kelly Holcomb is with us. You talked to him several weeks ago. Kelly, say hello to Michael. Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? Yeah, you doing good, Kelly. Enjo enjoyed our interview last time, man. I told him, guys, you're really good, man. But I, I got to go back to the Florida thing. I, I was talking to George yesterday. We were talking on the air. Like, how, why, why has Florida gotten so bad? I, is it? I mean, I understand the day of the transfer portal. I'm sure you got a bunch of transfers in, but like, uh, did Dan Mullen do any recruiting or like, why, why are they? They're just they they look really, really bad the other night playing against a third string quarterback and just did they weren't in the game. I, and I know they got the kid from Wisconsin, and he didn't. You know, I, I'm going to give him because I was a quarterback, and I understand it's a hard position, and I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. But just how bad have they become? Yeah, I mean, you can only blame Dan Mullen for so long, particularly yeah. in the in the era of the portal. I mean, t Tennessee, South Carolina, LSU, Ole Miss, Arkansas, on and on and on. They you can flip these rosters pretty quickly. Uh, I don't think we could be blaming Dan Mullen anymore. I I think Dan Mullen probably wins that game. I think he's that good of a coach. I realize uh, you know they had soured on him there in Gainesville, but I wouldn't be surprised if he's back in the SEC before long. I still think he's a better coach and probably about half the, the coaches that are currently in the SEC. But to answer your question, why is Florida so bad? Well, I think they made a, a major mistake of not flipping the roster when they got there. They basically waited a year for, for some unknown reason. They put it all on Anthony Richardson, and sometimes he was amazing, sometimes he wasn't. And when he was amazing, he gave them a shot on Saturday. When he wasn't, uh, obviously they, they were massively disappointing. And I think – that looks to be the case once again, but it's even worse because last season they can rely on the ground game. They, the offensive line was a strength. The offensive line looked like a train wreck against Utah. So uh, they have two offensive line coaches. They're having a false start seemingly every possession. Maybe they need three offensive line coaches down there. I don't know what in the world <laughs> is the problem, but uh, 
yeah, it's not a good look. And and the fact, again, that they waited about a year to flip the roster, I think that was a major mistake. And, you know, if you've been following the Florida program for a couple of years, they have made one mistake after another at the quarterback position. Jaden Rashada, uh, Ole Miss has got a quarterback that, that was committed to Florida for a long time. Austin Simmons is his name. He reclassified, and he the plan was for him to be on Florida's roster right now. Well, he's on Ole Miss roster. Anthony Richardson, I mean, can't blame him. He was the number four pick in the overall draft, but they, they really needed him back. It, it's just been one issue after another at the quarterback position, and nothing we've seen from Billy Napier, I, I think, suggests that he knows what he's doing when it comes to uh, SEC quarterbacks. Oh, I kind of agree with you. What did you think about the, uh, you know, we're, we're obviously in Vol Nation, in the middle of Vol Nation out here. What, what did you think about? I know they weren't playing much when Virginia, Virginia's, they're not a very good football team right now. I, you know, I don't know where they're going from here, but uh, it looked like Tennessee has, we, we all know their offense, their offense accolades about last year. They went down the Orange Bowl. Joe Milton played really good. Uh, he had a little stretch in there where he didn't play great, but he, he came back on, but it looks like their defense has gotten a lot faster. It looks like their defense is kind of catching up with the offense of being fast at every position. What do you think about their debut? Yeah, that's. I mean, that's something we talked about uh, on my show all off season. This is going to be the the best, deepest, most, most talented defense that Josh Heupel's had to work with. I, I think the the overall roster is better this year across the board than it was last year. Now. Maybe not some of the high-end talent. They, they don't have a top-10 pick on the offensive line. And I think there's a, a step, a drop between Hen and Hooker and Joe Milton, obviously. And, uh, you know, Jalen Hyatt was incredible. But I'm talking 1-85. to I think this is a better overall roster. And the fact that Tennessee, I thought they just looked kind of average. And they won by nearly 40 points. I think that gives you an indication of how good this football team is. And if uh, you know Joe Milton didn't have a, a flawless game, he was he was voted co-offensive SEC Player of the Week for some reason. I don't I don't think he deserved that, <laughs> but he didn't have a bad game. But I think he could play a lot better, and they're going to need him to, particularly uh, on the road at places like Gainesville and, and Tuscaloosa, and even home games against Georgia and Texas A&M if, if Tennessee is going to beat those teams. Yeah, talk talk a little bit about this uh, this game. This I was reading something about it earlier. This game between Auburn and Cal. It looks like a kind of competitive game. And then you get Hugh Freeze over here talking on you know the other day in his press conference talking about he didn't like going to California. He didn't make the schedule obviously, but wasn't going to bellyache about it. But it looks like Cal's got a pretty good football team, and uh, I think they had 669 yards of offense the other day, and they they got some guys that can. They got a guy that in the Ot kid that can run the football. I know Auburn's got three running backs that that's really good, probably the strength of their team, but how do you see this one playing out? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's going to be a close game, and I, I pulled up the stats while you were talking there. And, and again, you know, there's only one week of play, and you got to factor in competition, but Cal was – they were not playing Mercer or Alabama A&M. They played North Texas, which, again, yeah. not, not the greatest, but not the softest team either. Uh, they're number five in the country right now, 347 rushing yards per game. 58 points, that's number eight in the country. I think Auburn's defense is going to have their hands full, and I was very impressed with Auburn in their debut. Uh, again, they were they were kind of playing a, a weaker team, but very impressed. The quarterbacks, though, I mean, red zone Robbie, he, he showed up big in the in the red zone, scored three touchdowns, I believe, the, the backup quarterback. Peyton Thorne had really one really nice throw in the second half, but he looks kind of shaky. If he cannot improve – but I would not be surprised at all if Auburn drops this game at Cal. Yeah, that's kind of what that's intriguing to me. I'm I'm interested to see that. So the last one, let, talk about the Texas A&M uh, Miami game. Uh, surely Miami will be better than they were last year. Uh, they they had a nail biter last year. I think it was 17 to nine. But uh, looked like Connor Wegman had a good game and five touchdown passes. And uh, just kind of preview that game for us. Yeah, neither, neither one of these teams could be any worse, could they? I mean, that was just god awful. I mean, it was five and seven, both of them. I mean, we, last season we should have got some uh, compensation for for watching this football game, but I, I think this year it'll be a little bit better. Uh, I was wildly impressed with Texas A and M in the opener against New Mexico. Again, I get it; New Mexico is kind of a a garbage team, but they were pushing the ball down the field, utilizing all this talent they have at receiver and Connor Wigman. I know it's early. I'm, I'm trying to get ahead of the hype train, though. I, I think he 
if he continues to play like like I've seen him play, I think he can be a leading candidate for the Heisman Trophy out of the SEC. That's it's really going to be determined how he does against Alabama if he can live up to that hype. But uh, yeah, I I don't and I watched Miami. They were impressive. They they were playing the other Miami in in week one. I don't under, I don't understand how the two Miamis can go head to head. I thought that was illegal, but. Uh, Miami's got some nice athletes, but not near the quality team that Texas A&M has. And I have no respect for the home field advantage down there at Miami, the Florida Miami, of course. So I, I think Texas A&M wins this game easily. Uh, and and a last, lot of empty seats there. Go ahead, Kelly. Yeah, George. Just just the last thing, and we talked a little bit about LSU, but Brian Kelly. Uh, obviously, that was the first game, but I'm like you. I felt like those guys quit. And I'm sure there's probably some grumblings down there about all that because he's in a high-profile position. He wanted to take that job, obviously. But uh, does that does that put him on the hot seat any? No, because he won so big last year. And, yeah. again, maybe Florida State. I mean, they may be a top two or three I team in the country. I think they're really good, yeah. yeah. They, they impressed me. I trashed them all off season, and now – now those fans are living in my mansions. Believe me, I, I think I got more Florida State fans than SEC. Well, I don't know if I'd call them fans, but more uh, followers than SEC followers at the moment based on some of the things I said this offseason. So they were wildly impressive. I think LSU can get this cleaned up, but it is troubling, and it's it's kind of a recipe for disaster when you got two quarterbacks and, and one of them struggling and everybody's calling for the backup. You got arguably the best defensive player in the country in Harold Perkins. And, uh, I mean, LSU coaches did an outstanding job of, of making him a non-factor. That, I mean, somebody should, I don't know, lose their job, but somebody needs to pay for that. I mean, that was, that was just foolishness, I thought. Uh, that, that Harold, Harold Perkins, we didn't even hear his name during the FSU game. So get him back into the role he was playing last week. And I, I think that fixes a lot of LSU's woes. But, uh, yeah, they, they have got a lot to prove. This, this based on week one, again, I'm trying not to overreact too much, but this so far looks like the team, there's always one or two that gets billed as a preseason top ten and doesn't even finish ranked by the end of the year. LSU right now is the leading candidate, I think, to that to happen. Mike, real quick here, do, do you have any confidence in Vandy going up to, to Wake Forest and, and winning? Yeah, because, uh, you know, I, I've not been impressed with Vanderbilt so far this season, but they keep winning. And imagine saying that two or three years ago about Vanderbilt football program. Mm -hmm. So if they can put it together, if they could play four quarters of a, of a game, I think they can beat Wake Forest. I, AJ uh, uh, Swan, AJ Swan's got to play a lot better in my mind. I, I don't know, something's, something's up there. I thought he was going to be, you know, one of the better quarterbacks in the East this year, and he's not looked at the the past defense has just been a train wreck. But uh, yeah, I mean, I've got not great confidence, but I but I would not surprise me if uh, Vanderbilt can get that win. Michael, before you go, uh, for people who maybe are hearing you for the first time, how can they watch your show? Yeah, appreciate that. We're highest rated SEC show on Apple and Spotify. It's called That SEC Podcast. We're on YouTube. We do YouTube lives shows all the time. In fact, we're doing one here at, uh, every Thursday and Sunday, 6 o'clock Eastern, 5 Central. And, yeah, I'm all over Twitter at SEC Mike. Beautiful. Thank you for doing this. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.